So we are learning about entropy. And last time we defined entropy and we proved some property of this. Again, entropy is measuring, I mean, the, how much information does this random variable provide? Or this random variable, or this probability distribution. And this is roughly the amount of information. That x gives and this amount is measured by number of the bits so that's i mean the intuitive meaning <coughs> and let's use this to i mean solve some problems so we can actually see some application so one simple application we see and then we will prove some useful lemma again and then use that lemma to prove other facts. You might have seen this kind of game. So let's say there are n coins and there are real coins and fake coins. And now you want to distinguish them. You want to determine which one is real coin, which one is fake coin. And how you can do that is that they have a different weight. Say real coin has weight 1 and fake coin has weight slightly higher than 1. And you, all you have is this, I mean, weighing machine. Mm, yeah, that's a pretty bad picture. So you grab some coin and then you put it on this weighing machine. Then it shows that, uh, let's say you, this is two plus, mm, let's say, this is the panel. Yeah. If you, you, let's see. If you measure it, measure three coins, and then the number was two plus two, one over two n, then you know that one of them is fake. In general, you weigh k coins, and the result was two plus, I mean, k plus s over two n, then you know that s of them fake coins. Let's use some letter other than M, K. <coughs> and how many times do you have to weigh to determine exactly which one of them is fake and which one of them is, I mean, real? Obviously, I mean, the easy way is that you take one and then weigh, you take one and weigh, you take one and weigh, you take one and weigh. But can we actually do better? And if we can do better, I mean, what would be the, I mean, limit? Obviously, I mean, you cannot do it with one time, if any sufficiently large. And, I mean, we are not interested in about upper bound for now, but uh, we can show a lower bound that it cannot be too low. So, we can phrase this in this way. Let's say S1 to SK be the subset of N. Which are the, I mean, this pile that we want to, I mean, weigh at ice time. Then for any two distinct subsets, A and B. There exist I such that SI intersection with A has different size than SI intersection with B. So 
So if you think about this, this situation is exactly what we want. Let's say you have a situation that the A is exactly the set of fake coin. And there is another situation that exactly that B is the set of fake coin. Those two are the different situation. And we want to distinguish these two. When we know the information that we weigh S1, and then we know how many of them are fake coin, and S2, S3, and SK, you have this number. Then in these two situations, at least one of the number is different. So your result here is different. In other words, your result here uniquely determines what should be the exactly set of fake coin. So there are two to the n possibility of here of fake coin, and all of them has a different value here. Then you can actually determine what are the exactly fake coin and what are the real coins. So this says that uh, we can actually find the fake coin exactly. Then what we can show is the case at least 2 minus 3 log 1 times n over log 2 n. <coughs> so we can I mean, prove this in combinatorial way, but uh, we can also use entropy pr to prove it. Essentially, those proofs are not, I mean, too different. Essentially, they are the same proof, but uh, entropy provides a, uh, I mean, better platform for you to, I mean, simplify all the computation. And then, I mean, if you get used to the entropy, you can actually deal with those things in a simpler way. So, let's see a naive way. So one naive way is that, uh, let's say for, we define f for each subset a, subset of bracket, a, bracket n, which is a, and you just simply write down the intersection with uh, this s1 to sk. We are assuming that uh, these sets are given. Then, this assumption says that uh, this map is injective. F is injective. Then what do we have? And each of the, this number is between 0 and n. So, there are 2 to the n elements, and here it's, I mean, bracket n union 0 to the n to the k. So we must have n to the 1 to the k, n plus 1 to the k is at least 2 to the n. Then this implies k is at least 1 minus 3 log 1, if you do the computation, n over log sub 2 n. Which proves the right order, but uh, now we want it to prove it 2 instead of 1. So constant is wrong. Why do we get this long constant? Is that uh, if we reveal this one information, we have to see how much, I mean, candidate set of A shrinks. So we, I mean, in the as the entropy setup, you choose this A uniformly at random. That's a random variable, and these also become random variable each of these, and we want to measure how much partial information each of these gives. When we fix this, we wish that the space of candidate set is shrinked by 1 over n, 1 over n plus 1, in either case, but that's too much to hope for. That's the reason why we get the wrong constant. Then, we can actually prove it in a combinatorial way by considering this. So. If you think about the, uh, I mean, Chernobyl bound. So if this set is chosen uniformly random, then what's this? This set is nothing but the binomial, I mean, distribution of size of S1, comma, half. And we know that in expectation, this is very concentrated to half of SI. And the concentration can be measured by using Chernobyl. 
So what we are essentially doing is that uh, we know that uh, if this has uh, this distribution, then this is uh, it's very unlikely that uh, this has very smaller number or very big number. With high probability, this is very concentrated around here. So we can, by ignoring unlikely event, <coughs> we can actually, I mean, cut, I mean, we can actually show that uh, this in general shrink the space by square root of n more of close to square root of n instead of n factor. So, for each SI, if you use turn of bound, it implies that at most, say, 1 over 100 n times 2 to the n, subsets of n satisfy this. So, subsets a of n satisfy, say, this. So, Maybe we write the log square root of n first. So, by turn off, we know that uh, this is the expected size of this, if a is chosen at random. And you add this, I mean, add a term, then you apply turn off bound, then you show that uh, you can measure the probability that this is, I mean, not within this range. And that actually translates to the counting. So at most that many subsets satisfy this. So if we read uh, script S to be set of S set of A. Subset of bracket N, which is A, that for all N, for all I, SI intersection with A is uh, as expected. Uh, and I forgot to say one thing. Assume that K is at most N. Otherwise, there is nothing to prove. Because this is what we want to prove. And yeah, let's say N is large. So that this is smaller than N. So these are the, you just delete the unlikely event. These are the remaining event, remaining sets. It's always difficult to write in calligraphic way. <laughs> and then out of two to the n subsets, how many deleted? For each i, you delete at most one over 100 n times two to the n, I mean, fraction you deleted. So remaining one is, I mean, many of them remained. <laughs> now, for each set in this script path, where does it lie? If we consider this f again, this function, then it always lies in, say, i1, i2, ik, where ii I is uh, interval which is at least the uh, half of the size of SI minus 10 square root of n log n and at most uh, I mean half of the size of SI plus 10 times lo square root of n log n so it lies in this interval of length slightly more than square root of n square root of n times log n times some constant. Then, what do we get? Again, the, by same reasoning, the length of this is 20 log n times square root of n, and k. So that's the size of this. This has to be at least 
the size of s 2 to the n minus 1. If you show, prove it, then I mean, with some computation, you can show this. This is what we want. But essentially, the same information, but here we actually ignore some. Give me a moment. Ignore some cases. So you actually kick out some unlikely event, which actually loses some information, which is in this case all, I mean, observed in this little one term. And yeah, that's, I mean, you lose some information about the unlikely term, which is observed here, and then you do the discriminatory counting. But uh, in many other applications, we may not be afford to lose those unlikely events, and we want to somehow, I mean, get the information about that, which can be actually done with uh, entropy. So essentially, same proof can be written by using entropy. So let's say A is a subset chosen uniformly at random. which is a probability distribution or random variable. And each of these is a random variable containing some information about this A. <coughs> and as this has a, I mean, distribution of binomial random variable, so let's say you consider binomial random variable, what's the entropy of this? I mean, if you just simply use the uh, use the formula for entropy, this is what you get. And you use, I mean, it is known that, for example, if we have I mean, S, so that uh, if S and M over 2 are very close, then we know that uh, M choose S is roughly 2 to the M over square root of half n pi e to the negative, say, t square over n, where t is absolute value of uh, M minus 2S. I mean, again, using this, you actually, using this plus Chernoff, you cut the, cut the S's, so when S is much smaller than half M minus, say, again, uh, some big theta of N to the half log N, again, I mean, if you use this or so you actually I mean take the terms which are not lying in this interval you just show that that's small and then inside of here you just use this formula to put it here then this half times m half times this cancels out and this is nothing but uh, some constant so essentially I mean log of this is what you get and then the values here you use the I mean basic property of binomial coefficients, then you actually can show that uh, that's half plus little of 1 plus log 2m. That's, I mean, a simple way of, I mean, getting what we want. But if you do, uh, I mean, more tight con concentration, then you actually get the parallel number. Give me a moment. Let me enter. Let me write down the exact formula. Yeah. So you can actually prove that the binomial coefficient m half has an entropy exactly half times log two 
2 pi e m half pi e m. This. So this is nothing but the log 2 m plus some constant. So actually, we can show that uh, I mean this, but uh, that requires some computation. So I mean, but uh, it's easy to actually see that uh, this holds, which proof is essentially similar with uh, this ignoring smaller, I mean, ignoring unlikely event case. But uh, if you do better con computation, you can actually, I mean, make sure that you don't actually lose anything. Then, anyway, then what do we know? By our, uh, by our assumption, this k random variable actually determines a. So h of a has to be same as the entropy of this joint distribution. And by subjectivity, this is summation of entropy of each one of them. And that's summation of i equal 1 to k half log 2 si plus let's write it this way big O of 1 so now what do we know each of si has size and most n so this is nothing but the half times k log 2 n plus big O of k and this is uniform random variable, I mean, out of the 2 to the m choices. So entropy of A is nothing but n, which is satisfied this. So this shows that k is at least hmm, n minus p of k. Oh, no n over half times log n plus big O of 1. Which is 2 minus 0 of 1 times n over log n. You can actually get a better 0 of 1 term here. So this, hopefully this gives you some idea on how, I mean, entropy can be used in some situation. So in this case, I mean, actually, th the combinatorial proof was not also, not too much complicated either. But the uh, later case, I mean, entropy sometimes, I mean, allows you to avoid the uh, more complica complicated computation. So let's prove one more property of entropy, which will be useful. <coughs> so this is kind of generalization of subadditivity. So let x1 to xn be random variable. And let a1 to ak subsets of bracket n where each i is in a list s sets among these a1 to a k and let x sub a i be Collection of xi where a lies in ai. So, for example, we have x, x1, x2, x3, then a1 is 2, 3, a2 is 1, 3, a3 is 1, 2. Then xa1 is x2, x3, xa2 is x1, x3, xa3 
is x1, x2. Yeah. In this situation, the conclusion is then we have S times entropy of x1 to xn together is a more summation of the entropy of x ai. For example, if we take the entropy of this, entropy of this, entropy of this, then that's at least twice of the entropy of this. <coughs> so it's a generalization of sub additivity. When s is 1, this is nothing but, uh, I mean, slightly stronger than, but essentially sub, -addi sub additivity. I mean, again, those random variables could be dependent on each other. So, but uh, what it says is that the here x1 is counted twice, x2 is counted twice, uh, x3 is counted twice. So everything is counted twice, but uh, they are dependent, so they actually, this is actually has a smaller entropy than this. And this also has a smaller entropy than h of x1 plus h of x2 plus h of x3. But because of the dependency, how much you lose from here and how much you lose from the sum, how much you lose from the sum, they are actually smaller. The losses are smaller here than how much they collectively lose times s. So that's roughly what this shear lemma says. So we can prove. We use induction on s. If s is 1, then this is, I mean, subadditivity. You, I mean, consider a, a1 to k, a, k, so that the each i have occurs at least once. Then you can find a prime i subsi subset of a i, so that a prime 1 to a prime k is a par partition. Then you use subadditivity. Then you show that the uh, I mean, h x one to x n is at least summation of a entropy of x a prime i, which is a most summation of entropy of x a i. So it's okay for s equal one. So now assume that the uh, assume the proposition holds for s minus one, <coughs> and if there exists a i, which is the entire a n, then induction hypothesis implies the conclusion because if there is such x a i, which is same as x1 to xn. So you delete one term here, one term here. The remaining thing is s minus 1 with, with uh, I mean, and you delete this a i, the remaining term satisfy the condition with uh, s minus 1. So you apply induction hypothesis, then you get this desired inequality. So. If not, then what you do is you choose two sets, AI and AJ. Then what we want to do is we want to replace these two into uh, other sets so that uh, this expression, this entropy drops. But with drop, dropped one, if we show that the dropped one is still bigger than that, then we 
complete our proof. But while dropping it, we want to make sure that the, if we drop, I mean, if we replace this two with new one and replace this two, another two with new one, and you repeat, and at some point you have a one set, which is entire one. Then you reduct to the this case, and then you delete this, and then you go to the induction step with the S minus one. That's what we want to do. In order to do that, what do we have to replace this with? Is we want to replace this with uh, AI union AJ and AI intersection with AJ. So we want, so this is a bigger set. So that's, I mean, suitable for our purpose. So what we want to do is that this, whether, I mean, the information that X AI and X AJ carries is more than the information that X AI union AJ, X AI intersection AJ carry. So how do we prove this? Is that uh, if you consider this expression, so. So we have this and this and this, right? So the information this AI gives and information that AJ gives are the mutual information that are the XT, where T lies here. And I mean, the dependence between the XS and XS prime, S is not a good choice of a letter, XA and XB which lies in here, A and B here. They might be also dependent, so that also provides a mutual information between XA, I, and XA, J. But uh, mainly, I mean, the, say, C lies here. Then X, C are actually common information on here. So we want to kind of choose the, co I mean, that's what we know. So we want to kind of, I mean, measure the common, inter I mean, common information between this set, this set, this set. So, the random variable, collective random variable lies inside of here. And we want to measure how much does it, I mean, have a dependency between this and this. How much mutual information does it provide? Or how much additional information does this provide in addition to this? But by dropping condition, This is at most this. If we forget this, then obviously the new information that this provides is larger. But what does this say? If you chain rule, this is nothing but the entropy of these all together, which is A, X, A, I, union, X, J. So these three all together gives the same information as this, minus x, a, j. These two together gives a information a, j. And by chain rule, x, I mean, no, sorry, a, a, h, x, y is same as h, x, y, minus h, y, which is this. And similarly, watch this, h, x, a, Xi, so this together give us X, X, uh, AI minus H AI intersection with AJ. Then you move this to here, move this to here, then the entropy of union plus entropy of intersection is smaller than. This. So this is what we want. So we modify the collection by replacing AI and AJ with its union and intersection. Until when? Until 
we have a set which contains all the elements. Why are you doing that? We don't increase the entropy. Once we have a set bracket n, then we delete it and we apply the induction hypothesis and this proves the induction. So, I mean, using this we can prove, I mean, several results. I mean, the one video is getting a bit long, but let's do this. So, for example, uh, If we say that let f be a family of vectors in S1 to say Sn for some finite sets S1 to Sn. And say let A1, AM be a collection of subsets of bracket n and each i belong to at least s sets in the collection. So for each i, let the fi be the set of projections, all projection of the elements of this calligraph f on the smaller product subspace, not subspace, product. Then we want to say that the number of vectors in this calligraphic F is at most, I mean, to the, I mean, the number of points in here to the S is at most the multiplication of all this calligraphic Fi. So what it means is that in simple, if you have a in two dimension, you have a point, this six point. If you do the projection here and projection here, you have one, two, three, five, one, two, three. If you take the product, then what do you count? You count on all number of nine points in here which is on right hand side when s is 1 and left hand side is 6 so it's saying that this 6 is at most 9 so if you take this box which contains f then number of points in the box is at least the number of points in s in f that's what it says when s is 1 and when s is higher and uh, similarly i mean you consider the points on R3, I mean, say, then you have some points, then you do the projection onto the this plane, and projection onto the this plane, and projection onto the this plane, and you count the number, 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 and you multiply three together, then that's at least the number of points square. And the proof is, I mean, you can just use that the F is a, I mean, point 
uniformly chosen from all points on this strip F. Then for X and F1 to Fn are random variable. So if you randomly choose it, then you get the first coordinate, second coordinate, and nth coordinate, and they are also random variable. For xai, which is f, fj, where collects two pool of fj, where j is in ai, then the previous proposition implies that uh, what do we have? So s times entropy of f is exactly s times log of f, because our choice is uniform among all discrete f. This is nothing but this. And because what's this entropy? We know that entropy is maximized when it is uniform. So this is at most the uh, size of fi taking log. So from this, what do we get? We get the conclusion. So this corollary is about counting discrete points. But uh, if we have, a, say, some region here, then we know that this can be approximated by considering small boxes. And by counting the boxes intersecting with this measurable body, say. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 14, 17, 19. So you count 19, right? And you make this, I mean, lines finer and finer. You put more lines, lines, and then this number of boxes actually, oh, I mean, number of boxes times the unit, I mean, this area of this box, that measures the that approximates the area of this measurable body in r2 or in in general in rn in rn you can do the same thing you consider the n dimensional boxes and make it smaller and smaller then measuring this volume is same as just counting the boxes then by using this we can actually prove that let b be a measurable body Measurable body means that uh, you can measure its volume in the nth dim n dimensional Euclidean space. Then let volume of B be its n dimensional volume. And say let volume of pi denote the uh, n minus 1 dimensional volume of the projection of b on the hyperplane. and by all coordinates besides the ice one. Then we have that the volume of B to the M minus one is M most if you all multiply the volume of Bi. N minus one's dimension volume of Bi. So in other words, if you have some three dimensional body and you project it here and project it to say x, y, g, project it to x, y plane and project it to y, g plane and you project it to x, y plane and compute the area, 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 you multiply them together then that's the upper bound of the square of the volume here. I mean, you can just prove it by using this fact. And by this fact, you can actually approximate this up to epsilon. And just like the you are doing in analysis, you show that the for arbitrary epsilon, I mean, you can actually have a, this inequality 
then I mean without epsilon this has to be also true so now I mean we have collected all tools so now we will use it to prove some I mean theorems in graph theory in the next video